just all right so uh thanks brendan and good morning everyone i'm uh, christy rubenstein from diana c myers and associates and we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the fourth Eastern and Western PA COC webinar training of 2019. Uh, this is the final training in this sort of series we've been doing that's really looking at youth in particular. Uh, so we're glad you're able to join us. Uh, today's webinar is called Moving Beyond the Stereotypes, Commercial Exploitation, and Domestic Trafficking of Children and Youth. Um, Leading us through today's final session in the series will be the experienced and very skilled trainers who also led us through the last three trainings, and that would be Elizabeth Allen and Andrew Palomo from Valley Youth House. Uh, for those unfamiliar with Valley Youth House, they are a leading provider of services for youth experiencing homelessness and housing instability in Pennsylvania. Uh, so just a little bit about our, our trainers. Elizabeth Allen has a master's degree and has been a professional in the mental health field for the past 20 years and has had many roles, including inpatient counselor, in-home family therapist, experiential therapy, ropes course facilitator, and mentor to youth and their families. As an instructor, Elizabeth teaches a variety of topics for Valley Youth House and has co-presented at the Pennsylvania Permanency Conference and the National Runaway and Homeless, Homeless Youth Conference. Andrew Palomo has a master's in social work and has been working with runaway and homeless youth for over 15 years. He began his career as direct care staff at Valley Youth House's youth shelter and transitional living program. He oversaw the daily operations of Valley Youth House's maternity group home and also implemented the first LGBT drop-in center in the Lehigh Valley. Currently, Andrew is the director of research, evaluation, and innovation at Valley Youth House where he supports data-driven decision-making and results-oriented performance for RHY programs. Uh, before we get started on today's main presentation, I'm going to quickly cover some webinar logistics. First, a um, handout versions of the slides in this presentation were sent out last Thursday from the PA Balance of State COC um, email address, uh, that, so you can go back and find those for your reference if you don't have them. Uh, second, please note that this webinar is being recorded. I, I heard Brendan press the button and uh, made a little announcement. So uh, it is being recorded and we'll send out a link uh, to access the recording in case you need it. Third, as you know because you made it on to today's training, the Commonwealth has switched to Skype for Business um, from WebEx. Uh, so due to this change, staff at COC funded agencies We'll need to fill out an online survey after the webinar to let us know you have participated in today's training. Uh, filling out the survey will allow us to credit your organization with participating in this training, which is mandatory for COC-funded agencies. So if you would like to be marked as having participated, we will need you to fill out that survey. We will be sending the link out to you after this training. Um, if you did not register for this webinar but were forwarded the link for this event from someone, someone else, um, perhaps that you know, um, you might not receive that email. So you can submit your name and email address to Brendan in the chat box or send an email to the PA Balance of State COC uh, email address, that's pabos at pennsylvaniacoc.org, to request the survey link. Um, and finally, as with previous webinars, we're going to have opportunities for Q&A throughout the webinar, but we're going to keep everyone muted. So we ask that you use the, um, there's not a Q&A box this time, but we have the IM box that Brendan mentioned earlier, um, or conversation it says at the top. Uh, you can use that box to type in your questions or comments. And you can do that any time during the webinar. And then during the Q&A breaks, Brendan's going to read your questions to the trainers. And we should also have time for questions at the end. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth and Andrew. Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Andrew Palomo from Valley Youth House. Um, and I use he, him pronouns. Um, and this is Elizabeth Allen, also from Valley Youth House. And I use she, her pronouns. And um, this go around, we decided not to have the introduction with our pictures because we were like, hmm, they should all be familiar with us. And if not, um, the mystery will linger. Um, and with that, I will uh, turn it over to Elizabeth Allen. 
the reality is Andrew was tired of everyone realizing that he's actually shorter than me in real life. So today we are going to uh, talk a lot about trafficking. It is an issue that it has been something that honestly has been around for ever, but it's really kind of hit that that point where it's reached the, the level of consciousness um, for the mainstream. And so we're really going to try to give you guys some fundamental information as much as we, we can. You know, the reality is that both of us have been trained in this information and are able to easily present one, two, three days trainings. And they're like, can you do this in 90 minutes? And we're like, sure. So we are really going to give you a very brief snapshot of what is going on with the hope that then moving forward, you will be able to get more information, perhaps more training. Uh, there's some fantastic train the trainer programs out there. Uh, myself, I went through one through GEMS based out of New York. And um, that's really where we, we got some of our fundamental information from along with things like Valley Against Sex Trafficking, BCAT, and some other local organizations to us where we've gotten information plus, you know, information that we've gathered from the federal uh, government over the years as we're involved with them as well. And in addition, like we, uh, a lot of the stuff that we're going to uh, discuss in this, in this webinar also comes from our experience of running our shelters, our maternity group homes, and some of the things that we've noticed over the past years of of, of how this issue actually interplays with, with our programming and our direct service. So you'll be hearing a lot of those stories. And, uh, and with all those resources that Liz mentioned, we are also a resource. And at the end of the webinar, our um, emails will be available. And uh, anyone can um, shoot us an email, and we will try to respond as the best way we can. Right. So as you can see, the training principles are present. You know, we really want to make sure that not only is this relevant, it's relevant, it's timely that you can use the information that we're giving you today right away. Um, it really is informed by survivors, and that's the beauty of it, because it's one thing to use a lot of theory and research, and we're going to talk about that in some of the statistics, um, both good and bad. And we also want to make sure that it's trauma-informed. You know, we talked a lot in one of the previous seminars about being trauma-informed, brain development, and really hearing those stories. And those stories are often very powerful, and they also – fewer where they are, and also opening yourself up to the idea of learning something new, challenging beliefs that maybe you've had previously, um, and the fact that we don't know everything and we're continuing. So this is kind of an open category no matter how you, you, you look at it. There are things that you know I learned two, three years ago that I've been open to um, changing my mindset on in the past year, even the past six months. And really just kind of going with that. So the idea, very similar to in the beginning when we did the first couple of trainings and we talked about welcome to the sea of gray and then welcome back to the sea of gray, some of this is also very gray. And it's constantly evolving. The information that we know, what is best practice is changing. And so just being open to all of that. So the first thing that we're really going to talk about is language advocacy. And I really want to spend some time here because this is a key to helping create a framework that is going to be beneficial to the youth, the young adults, and even any adults that you come across that may have become victims and then later survivors of human trafficking. And so this slide that you're seeing is actually part of an activity that you can use. So for supervisors or um, staff that maybe want to bring this back to their coworkers, you use this and you literally put up these three images, these three words, and you talk about, you know, when you think about a teen prostitute, what are the images that come to mind? Um, for a lot of people, it's the traditional images of a streetwalker. Perhaps, you know, if you were a child of the 80s, um, pretty woman is a big one when you think about prostitutes. But then think about, when you think about a, a victim of human trafficking, what does that look like? And what does that image look like in your head? And then third, when you think of someone who is exploited, an exploited person, what does that image look like for you? So at this point, you probably have three separate images in your head, and so they kind of have these nice little compartmentalized ways. Um, and so one of the key things we want you to understand is teen prostitutes are victims of trafficking. And by a legal definition, they're also being exploited by an ethical and a moral definition. So while you may have had three separate compartments, 
they're actually all in the same room together. So again, that's an activity that you can use. Um, and so with that, also kind of looking at then the idea of language and sensitivity. So putting up an image, this is another activity where literally you could put up a sheet of paper and have up this the words teen prostitution and commercial sexploitation of children. And what ideas, what images, what words come to mind when you hear those those terms. And so, you know, take a couple quick seconds and think about, you know, what does come to mind when you think about teen prostitution. But then also think about when you hear the term um, commercial sexploitation of children. And for the sake of brevity, we're going to use the term CSEC for much of the, the training. And that means the same thing. So oftentimes when you do this activity, these are a lot of the words that end up Coming, coming to mind. And so these are what we'd hope that people would come up with. You know, a teen prostitute, oftentimes, it's the idea that they are resistant. And, you know, when we do this work, when we do this work with young adults, when we do this work with teens, oftentimes, you know, we're trying to give them our best selves. And we, we believe then that somebody is resistant. They're resistant to change. They're resistant to all kinds of things. And so that's going to be a very common term, along with easy, the idea that maybe they're a drug addict or a drug abuser, and the only reason they're doing it is for drugs. Um, it's just seen as a way to make money. It's seen as a choice. You know, um, talk about kids that are involved in the system, which would be the youth and young adults that we're, we're working with. You can see some derogatory terms that are used, and I'm sure all of you probably know plenty more, whether you have it, uttered some of them yourselves or you've heard friends, coworkers, family members, even the other youth refer to people uh, with those terms. You know, images as to how they are being dressed. And ultimately, whose problem are those folks? And oftentimes we see them as a law enforcement issue. But then when you think about somebody who has been a victim of um, sexual exploitation, we tend to think of them more as somebody who needs help, so they are vulnerable. They Hi, need or Elizabeth? want to be rescued. Yes. I'm sorry, it's Christy. Yeah. We lost the visual, just so you know. So Ooh, okay. I'm not sure um, what's going on. Hopefully, folks, if you have the, the the materials we sent out, the handouts, you'd be able to follow along. Uh, so you might want to go to your email and pull that up if, if you um, can. All right. I would say, okay, because everything looks normal on our end. Yeah, it just sort of disappeared. <laughs> so... Um, Brendan, I don't know if you want to try to reset the Yeah, presenter. I'm looking. I just went back to the previous slide. Did that maybe pop up? No. No? Okay. Here. Um, Liz, Elizabeth, I'm going to take over real quick and just share. No problem. Sorry to interrupt. That's okay. Okay. I think we should be good. Can you all see that now? Yes. Okay. I can see it. Perfect. All right. Sorry, Liz Elizabeth, you can go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. You pulled up yours. Yeah, I just, I'm, okay. I, yeah. Got it. Okay. I just had to minimize mine. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Um, you know, when we're talking about someone being a victim of CSEC, you know, again, someone who's abused, neglected. But the biggest thing is that who's, whose problem is it? And we often view that as being all of our problems. You know, we are all helpers. We're in the helping profession. And so instead of us seeing like, oh, this is a law enforcement issue, we're seeing it as our way of being able to help somebody and therefore we have something to give. Okay. And, and I think like changing the language, if there was one thing uh, to get out of this training would be changing that language because it reframes the issue um, as a form of child abuse, uh, you know, and, it, and, and just from my experience at working our, at our maternity group home, when we change the language, it really reframes our thinking and, and the process that we're doing 
um, with our young people, right? So instead of it, like what Liz said, instead of it being like, oh, um, they were prostitutes, they were willing participants, by changing the language of, of they're exploited, right, then it's like, how can we then provide the services? What's there in the community? So it really changes the mindsets in our team meetings, in, in the conversations we're having in supervision. So language is really crucial in, in what we're doing. And I've seen that firsthand that like when we do change the language and how, how we're interacting with our young people, it can then change the entire thought process of the team and then also gives us a common language to work from, right? Because I think like Liz mentioned before, all those three words conjure up different like prostitute, commercial, uh, CSEC, um, all, all conjure up different, um, different images for people, but we're talking about the exact same person, the exact same young person that needs help. Yeah. Um, and going even so far, and it's not on your slides, but there's even talk about the difference between, you know, do we need to move past the term trafficking? Mm -hmm. Because that's oftentimes we talk about sex trafficking, labor trafficking, and we're going to use those terms today, but really moving away from trafficking into exploitation. Um, because trafficking in itself is also a very loaded, loaded word and has a lot of images. And if you look at some of the past ads that have been done that are even for anti-exploitation, um, anti-trafficking, some of them, if you really look at them, have some connotations that are honestly damaging to the movement. Because, for instance, there's one in particular, and some of you may have seen it, and it's an image of a young girl. She's um, blonde hair, blue-eyed, Caucasian girl. And there's an image over her mouth, like, holding it shut. And you can see a tear coming down. If you look at that image in certain angles, you will recognize that if you blow it up big enough, you can see that the hand itself is Caucasian. However, when it's published, the hand looks darker skinned. And so it then looks like it's either a black or a brown person. And so then that plays into the stereotypes as to, you know, what is a pimp and who is trafficking um, young ladies and young men, and while a lot of our connotation, a lot of our statistics are going to be based on girls, you know, we also recognize that young men also are trafficked, just not as, at a highest rate, so there's not as much research on them, so if you start wondering why are we mostly talking about girls, the research isn't there on boys yet, the same level it is, it is on girls, but, you know, so again, just things to think about is, you know, even being able to move past trafficking to the idea of exploitation and going from there. So we just wanted to put that out there as well. So we really want to look at, you know, what are the definitions of commercial sex exploitation, uh, CSEC, and then, you know, the definitions of human trafficking for you. And so when you're looking at the definition of CSEC, you know, the key thing is that it is sexual abuse and it's involving a child in exchange for something of value or a promise to the child or another person. Um, and it's treating the child as a commercial sex object. It is considered to be a form of violence against children. And then if you see, if you look under here, it also talks about the federal law definition. And so if you're talking about a minor, it's all exploitation, even if when we get into some of the other definitions, we're gonna talk about things like force, fraud, fraud, and coercion. It doesn't matter. Those things do not have to happen if a child is under the age of 18. So when you're looking, for those of you who are working with young adults, the strict definition is kind of the one above. If you're working with also minors, you really want to take away maybe that force, fraud, or coercion part because that may, may, that may not be a, a part of it. Because the idea is as a minor, it, it doesn't matter. You've, you've kind of taken advantage at, at that point. Yeah, and just from just to look at the federal definition, right? Like, like what is human trafficking? And it, it really states that the rec it's the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of a person by means of threat or use of, of force, fraud, coercion, um, or deception of the purpose of, for the purpose of exploitation, right? So that is the federal law. But like what Liz said, when it involves a minor, um, like um, the, it automatically is um, sexual exploitation, right? So, and what does it include, right? So what do we see, right? We see um, in pornography, stripping, street exploitation, um, nude massages, um, those erotic massages that we've seen in the news um, down in Florida. Uh, there was a big bust recently. Es escort services um, when um, 
Craigslist and um, uh, some of the other websites still had them. There were those sections on the websites where uh, people were listing for escort services, although it's still happening. I mean, you can still see it on Twitter. Um, if, you, um, uh, if you look at Grindr or some of the other apps that are out there, um, escort services are still, uh, still there. Phone sex lines, although they've mo moved away from phone sex lines to actual um, video, like Skyping, and um, right, so we're, we're seeing that trend where it's not just on the phone, but it's also that, like, that webcam um, kind of um, en engagement. Private parties, um, this can include in the hotel parties or some, some form of a, um, event like that where people are hosting parties um, uh, for that. Gang affiliation and organized crime. Uh, family exploitation um, is something that's also that we, we see. Sex tourism in that international um, uh, uh, realm, the sex tourism in certain countries, but even here in the U.S. that, that still happens um, in, in specific locations. And then form of internet-based um, exploitation, such as like the webcamming um, and some of those online sites. So this is what C-Sex includes um, um, and just some of the forms that we are, we're seeing uh, when, when we're there. And I think it's important to keep in mind that some of these things, um, you know, we've all heard the, the joke of, you know, massage parlor and somebody can pay extra or whatever, but the things that sometimes throw people off are things like stripping or even exotic dancing, um, which are kind of gateways into it. I've actually even seen recently, I was watching a, another video, and it was um, Survivor Informant, so it was someone who had talked about getting out of the life, and that is a term that oftentimes folks that are involved in being exploited as they talk about being in the life and how hard it is to get out of the life. And the person talks about getting out and then trying to work with other women to get them out of the life. And they worked at a dance club. And it was interesting, the amount of comments were like, well, dancing doesn't count as, as being exploited. You know, it's not the same. And you're like, but it, but it is because it easily kind of leads its way into that. And when we talk a little bit later about how does somebody get into the life, we can we can speak a little bit more about that, or if people want examples, we can give those as well when we get to our first set of um, questions and comments. <clears throat> Labor trafficking, I'd like right. So when we're talking about um, exploitation of our young people, um, we also see that labor trafficking is something that uh, we see often with our runaway homeless youth, right? Uh, I think studies um, from the Urban Institute and some other um, big think tanks have noticed that labor trafficking is is present with with our young people, and some of our and, and some of um, the labor trafficking examples are nail salons. Um, you know, uh, that's something that we see those door to door magazine sales um, or. Um, or some of the energy sales uh, as well, any of those pyramid schemes that are just ripe for, for export, exploitation, right? So, like, if you're um, any types of those, we need to be careful of, of how, um, how payment is, is happening. Um, and that's the same thing goes with selling um, in, in parking lots and, uh, in, and in the streets, any of, like, the, the selling of perfume or cologne. Um, uh, nannies and housekeepers as well are sometimes like a part of that labor trafficking, um, especially in urban areas uh, where you have a large immigrant population. We see we see that happening, um, and then any labor that's done against someone's will, right? And and that debt labor that you owe me, uh, you owe me this, and therefore you need to work it off, right? And I think this is um, something that a lot of our youth who are are living on the street or living in um, unstably housed might find themselves. Um, involved in. Right, and that debt labor, you know, can be anything from, if you're talking about someone who came over to the United States, it could be as, as simple as, well, we paid for you to get over here, so now you owe us and you have to work that off. It's not unusual for people uh, to have, even if they came over legally, um, to have, like, their passports and their visas taken by the person who was holding on to them and having them locked up. So at that point, now they have no paperwork. And so they feel like they're, they're trapped in that situation or somebody provides them a place to stay and gives them food. It's like, well, that wasn't all free. I didn't do that out of the goodness of my heart. You know, you have to, to do this for us. Yeah. And, and a few years ago, I had a young man who was in this like debt labor kind of situation where he was um, selling um, things door to door um, in one of these pyramid schemes. And the person that he was working for would not allow him to leave the home unless he paid him a certain amount for the expenses that that were that the owner or this manager was um, a, a, a curing, right? So I think these are things that like um, that 
are a little bit too common for, for our runaway and homeless youth kids. Yeah, and I think there's things that run kind of under the radar because the reality is we've all seen – you know, those groups of young adults that are in parking lots in the, you know, at the mall and they're trying to spray you with perfume and they're like, hey, what fragrance do you like? Or they do knock and ask about energy or magazines. And they, you know, and they're, they become such a normal part of the annoyance of door-to-door solicitation that we just see it as that. We don't necessarily see that someone potentially might be in, in danger. I mean, an example I, I have is that someone that I know in my, my personal life had learned a little bit about CSEC from Valley Youth House because they had participated in our first ever uh, youth count here in the Lehigh Valley and had a young man come to her door and he seemed really nervous and he was trying to sell things and then he was just like, I don't care if you buy anything or, or, or not. Um, and he kept stumbling and finally then she realized something might be wrong and she was like, she very she could see a car off kind of in the distance and very carefully mounted him, would you like me to call the police? And he kind of signaled yes, and so she kept him, quote unquote, busy talking until the police department could come. At which point, then once they saw the cops roll up, the you know the manager drove away, and then the police were able to talk to this to this young person. You know, so again, it can happen in a very subtle and insidious sort of a way. And I think from from a case management point of view, I think these are where you have those difficult conversations with our young people. Like um, I often had like. Um, conversations with our young people. Hey, how did you? How how were you able to afford this bill if you have no employment, right? Or no formal employment, right? And like, oh, is it, are who are you working for? Where are you working for? And having those and, and keep probing as a case manager about like what what's really going on that like um, uh, with this uh, with our young people because sometimes that's that's how uh, you know we we talk about survival sex and what's going on with our young with our young people in order to make ends meet and, and pay some of their some of those bills it's still exploitation and, and I think our job is still to have those conversations with our with our young people and and help them like that consciousness raising and and seeing like how we can provide them with um, w- with skills needed to overcome that and then when you're having these debates in, in your team meetings right I think this has been something that like how do you then distinguish trafficking from other forms of exploitation, right? And I think that, you know, that AMP model is a very good way of do, doing that, which is what is the action, right? What is the action that's occurring? How, are, how is the young person being recruited? Is there transportation? Are they being provided something? Are there, um, how are they obtaining uh, things? And how are, are there attempts to um, uh, gain things? And then there should be some <clears throat> form of means, like what is, uh, what's going on? Is there force? Is there fraud? Is there coercion? Um, again, if someone is a minor, you don't need those um, those items. But for those who are over the age of 18, when you're asking yourselves, like, what is that? What is the force? What is the fraud? What's the coercion that's occurring? And then finally, what's the purpose? Is the purpose for a commercial sex act? And then, or is it for a labor service, right? So when you're trying to, like, have those debates, like, um, trying to really, like, understand what's really going on, um, um, for this young person um, is crucial in order to make those determinations and then being able to provide them with services. Then again, just another visual expert, uh, visual explanation, right, of commercial sex exploitation, which involves power, privilege, and authority, and, and that's the means of control um, over the person versus trafficking from the legal definition, which is force, fraud, and coercion which is there's some, um, um, some fraud that's occurring, some force, some coercion that's uh, going. Um, this is more from that legal perspective. Um, from the social worker in me is saying it, it doesn't matter. Exploitation and trafficking are equally bad, right? And we need to help our young people overcome that. And so if you're looking at just minors, so children, anyone under the age of 18, you want to look at these intersections of abuse and kind of how they're intertwined and how they start. So we have... Sex, child sexual abuse, then we have sexual exploitation of children, and then we have that commercial sexual exploitation of children and that trafficking piece. So in other words, if you've now hit the point of CSEC, that is also exploitation of children, which of course is also sexual abuse. And it's really kind of seeing how they, um, they kind of intermingle and it gets it all into the realm of being CSEC in that regard.
And then the next uh, next slides are just showing that like the from the Polaris project where they've been getting calls uh, regarding um, uh, CSEC, right? So this was a picture in 2006 using uh, using information from their hotline. Um, if you can go to the next one, and then we see that they've been getting more calls. Um, I do, as a, from a statistician uh, point of view, I uh, put a little asterisk on this. I think like over the past like um, two years, um, or at, at least in what I've noticed in the human service world, is that the past like two to five years, there's been an increase in training and, and people being able to identify CSEC and, and what it is, right? Um, I don't necessarily want to um, put a direct um, correlation to is there an increase in um, human trafficking occurring. I think it's always been there. I think we're, as professionals, we're better, uh, better able to identify it, better able to then provide services. And, and this has been a, a, a huge trend in the past three to five years where we, we as professionals are getting the training and, and implementing the services that are, that are needed. However, it still highlights that it's still, still a need in our country and, and that is, is occurring. Um, the other thing is just something to, to realize, like the flow of, of, of trafficking in the United States, right? Like some people believe that it's just coming from, um, um, from, a, from foreign, foreign land, but it's not necessarily true. We see that on the East Coast, it's this ebb and flow off the, uh, up and down the 95 corridor. There is some that is occurring from Latin America and coming up through, uh, through our southern borders. But it is happening in, in in various locations. With like, if you look at the um, um, like the sites, which are those red red dots, right? Um, they're happening um, in the East Coast and in the Midwest um, um, as well. So it's just something to to be aware of that like the the regional traffic flows for um, uh, at least in the United States, um, they're actually it's occurring everywhere. But then even here within Pennsylvania, I mean, I think I've, I've talked to, um, we don't have a map of it, but um, there's corridors, like the 222 corridor between like Lancaster and um, um, up here in, in, in the Lehigh Valley has always been, you know, a hot spot for gang involvement, but as well as, as, as for trafficking. Um, at the 95 corridor here locally on, on the eastern part of Pennsylvania as well. So, and I'm sure on the... I'm less knowledgeable on the Western side, but I'm sure like working with your local um, organizations um, could highlight some of those areas and hot spots in your local uh, local area. Right. And those corridors then even end up crossing states because if you look at the 222 corridor, um, it gives you a direct connection then eventually into New York. So you might have that gang activity, as we mentioned, that is maybe originating in New York. And so if they are using exploitation and trafficking as one of their income sources, they may be finding folks in New York City and then moving them throughout this eastern part of the of the, the U.S. And certainly when I've talked with some of our street outreach coordinators and street outreach workers and they meet with folks that have been trafficked, it's not unusual that by the time they meet a youth, they have moved around significantly and they may have started somewhere else. Uh, one of our coordinators was in New Orleans and was talking with a young lady that said she originally started off in Denver, Colorado, and ended up in New Orleans, kind of living a gutter punk life at, at that point. She had managed to get away from her from her exploit um, exploiter at that at that juncture. So we're going to go in the mist next, but before we do that, is there any questions about the information we've presented so far? Looking in the chat box, um, I don't see any questions at this point. Okay, great. Thank you, Brandon. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some myths. And so the first thing we want to talk about is some common statistics used. And these are probably some statistics that at some point many of you have already seen. And so when I show them to you, you're going to be like, what do you mean that's a myth? Um, so two of them, here are some common statistics that are thrown out about the number of youth that are at risk for commercial exploitation annually in the U.S. and then the common age of entry for um, this commercial sex industry. Here's the thing. We don't know where some of these, these supposed statistics came from. They're like open source numbers. And so when researchers have actually tried to find the origins of them in order to verify, they can't. Um, and then they've, so they've tried to do some smaller research. 
And part of the issue is that the sample sizes are very, very small. So very similar to how Andrew mentioned about how the statistics have gone up because um, more people are aware. The research they've been able to do, it's like, how do you find, you know, a sample size of a thousand people who are willing to, A, admit having been commercially exploited or trafficked, and then get in that statistic from them? You know, so even when you talk about things like the Polaris Project, who probably has some of the better information on some of this, their sample sizes are things like 125 people. And so you're talking really small samples. Um, and so this, for example, the one about the most common age for the commercial sex industry, as far as we can tell, the average age for being in the industry, period, so you're not necessarily talking um, child exploitation, but in general is 19, which is dead on the money of the age population that many of us are working with because we're talking about young adults. And those of you who were part of our um, trauma and adolescent brain training know that 25 is where development Happen. So we're talking there's still six years before their brain is even going to fully develop is at the point where they enter the life. Um, now, that being said, of those that they've been able to ask, 44% of them were 17 and under. So certainly you are talking about a good amount of minors, but that average age is, in fact, 19. Um, then there's these other ones that have been um, – bantered around, and I you know certainly, you know, several years ago, I had bought fully into the idea that within 72 hours of running away, there's a good chance that a child is going to be trafficked, the Super Bowl myth, and then the average life expectancy of a trafficked girl. And again, no one's quite sure where this information has come from. Now, the Super Bowl one, some of the origins of that one go back to 2011, when a lead prosecutor in Texas made a comment prior to one of the Super Bowls of it being the largest um, trafficking day in the United States. And somehow their comment became gospel. And so it has been, you know, passed on as this fact. And in fact, it is not. And what others will tell you is that the Super Bowl is a one-day snapshot of a 365-day-a-year problem. And the reality is, is there more trafficking during the Super Bowl in the area where the Super Bowl happened? Well, yes, because there's more people. So, you know, your, your, your pimps and your traffickers are going to look to try to drum up more business. But they say if you look at any large event, not even just a sporting event, they talk about some of the big conferences that, and conventions that happen in things like Vegas or in any major city, there will be an uptick for a couple of days. And then it drops back down again because a lot of this is very portable and mobile. Part of the reason it ends up being... Um, making big news, though, is that because folks have become law enforcement has become more aware of this, they will set up extra police enforcement so they can make bigger stinks. So there's a better chance you're going to capture more people, but there's more people there to begin with. So again, it kind of skews the statistics. Um, also, the life, average life expectancy of a traffic girl being seven years in the United States, again, we're not really sure where that's come from. And what we found is that these statistics in fact, end up becoming harmful to the issue as opposed to helpful because it keeps people from actually having honest conversations and being kind of almost dismissive of what's, what's going on. So you want to keep those things in mind and just spend a little bit of time, you know, kind of looking a little bit deeper into these. And so like the Polaris Project actually has a couple really nice short articles about some of those statistics and the origins of them if you would like to get a little bit more information. Other myths are that all prostitutes are willing participants, and that's something that um, is frankly not true, right? So I think like we, when we when we talk our, to our young people, we're realizing that like you know there's fraud, there's coercion, there's like you know it, there might be some gang involvement where like people are being threatened with their lives, right? So I think this is a, when we start talking to our young people, um, and there's been many studies um, that have done that, but even here at, at Value House, and I've talked to some of our young people, it, it's been that, right? Like there's been some kind of coercion, um, um, uh, either a physical threat or, or something similar uh, that they just didn't feel uh, safe where they were at. Um, it's also that survivor sex piece where exactly. they're trying to Correct. get their basic needs met. So are they a willing participant? Not really because it's not what you were looking to be doing. Your average person doesn't run away and say, okay, and I'm going to sell my myself. Mm -hmm. you know. 
the other myth is all immigrants smuggled into, into the United States enter willingly, right? And I think this is um, um, also a myth that it's not all. I mean, may, uh, some might, um, but there are a, a, a subset of that where, like, there is some coercion and there is fraud, right? Like, there, um, if you come to the United States, I will help you, like, um, um, gain a visa or I will be uh, pay you well. Um, there's also... Um, um, I've had two situations here uh, at Valley Youth House where um, w one young girl, um, her parents um, gave her to this man because he told her, like, if she comes to the United States, she's going to get a great education and that he was going to provide her with everything and that, like, uh, she was going to have a better life uh, because he was going to take care of her and put her into a private school. And then when she got here, that was not the case. Uh, it was actually forced labor um, as a domestic, um, uh, domestic servant. Um, and the other case where, uh, uh, that I have experience in is where one, um, uh, one young girl from Guatemala came here um, and uh, was, was um, detained at the border, somehow ended up here at Valley Youth House in one of our programs. Um, and um, someone who claimed to be her grandmother was like, like yeah, I would love, love to be reunified with her. Um, and then we did our due diligence, asked questions, like, so where is she going to be sleeping? How many people are living in the house? So we ended up finding out that she didn't have a bed there, um, that there were um, eight other women living there, which, which for me as a case manager at the time, like, was a red flag. Like, all right, there's um, no bedrooms, no bed for this woman you know, or for my client, and – there's eight other women uh, living there. So ended up like looking up at uh, working with an immigration lawyer and like looking up at um, arrests in the area. And there were like five arrests in that house uh, regarding prostitution. So we had a strong inkling that that might not have been the safest place to be with her. And we also didn't have any evidence that this was even her, her biological grandmother. Right. So uh, again, like I, it, um, again, Going back to this myth that all immigrants smuggled into the United States enter into it willingly, um, th that's not the case. And then myth three, all participants involved in human trafficking are criminals. And hopefully you can see that um, what, we're, what we're leading here to is that like really reframing and like a lot of our young people, they are the survivors. They are the, the, the victims that need services, right? So, um, um, so that's what we're seeing is that like it's providing them with that service, that consciousness raising, and those skills to be able to to move forward. Right, and again, that goes goes back to that language piece, you know, reframing that. So we're not viewing them as criminals; we're viewing them as somebody who needs help and services. So moving into now, how does all this happen in the first place? And part of that is we want to look at the sex industry as a, as a whole. Um, and we're not going to harbor too, too, too long on this, but we want to at least take a snapshot of where we are with the, um, with the idea of the sex industry. So part of this is we want to look at who is actually buying children for sex. Um, there's a couple obvious ones. There are things like pedophiles, and many of us are familiar with, with them. Um, this is a variation of a pedophile, which is basically um, – someone who is interested in, in post-prebuscent adolescent um, children. There's also a lot of what we refer to as situational abusers. And so they're using children for sex not because necessarily that they want to, but because they find themselves where it's, it's possible. Um, these men oftentimes engage in criminal activity with sex with minors without necessarily feeling any sexual attraction towards them. Um, and what's scary is that oftentimes these may be your typical family man and in every way seems like a normal person. And so this actually ends up creating a problem for law enforcement as well is because it looks like, you know, Joe Blow down the, down the store, he's a good family man. He has a good job. He's, you know, he's, he's in corporate America or he's, you know, a hardworking blue collar kind of a guy. And do we really want to bust them for, for something? Um, and those of you who are listening in are probably going, yes, absolutely, he needs to be busted. But, you know, these are some of the considerations that people come into, um, you know, or the comments of the, well, I didn't realize that she was, she was underage. And, you know, oftentimes our brains organize themselves around somebody who otherwise seems like a, quote, unquote, good guy. And so we really want to be careful of the situation of, um, situational abusers. 
there's also, you know, just the presence of the adult sex industry and just the way that it has grown over time. You know, being a person who has seen how even the sex industry and the porn industry in particular have changed from the 70s on up, you know, it used to be that it wasn't easily accessible. You know, you had to go specifically to a movie theater in order to to see a pornographic film. And then, you know, you had adult video stores. But even the advent of video really kind of changed the game. And as Andrew mentioned earlier, now there's a lot of those um, webcam sites where, you know, you don't need to do that. And social media is a huge piece of this is, as well. And, and so it's really kind of breaking things down. And, and not just the, the, the fact that uh, it's everywhere now, but also the um, sending money is so much easier now with like Venmo, with PayPal, Cash App. That's something that we're seeing at Value Pass that like it's just like the transfer of money. I, I no longer have to carry money but can still transfer a hundred dollars to this person in, in a snap. So that I think there's so many factors that are just um culminating to to um make CSEC a, a big issue or a bigger issue now. Right. And if you notice at the end there's that quote related to making um prostitution legal because there's always that idea of well, why don't we just make it legal as we know certain forms of prostitution are legal for instance in the state of Nevada um, and why don't we just make it legal everywhere and the, the issue is then how do you protect kids and you have so many youth who are being exploited you know how do you protect them and make sure that they they are kind of safe but then from there also getting into this um, some of the factors are things like violence towards individuals in the industry. And so this information is from Canada, but it still relates to, you know, the United States, the fact that, you know, women who are part of the industry are 40 times more likely to be murdered than their counterparts. And looking a little bit into that, then it talks about the fact that there really are very little perceived consequences. And you can see the statistics weighted to there. And, I mean, they're pretty sobering you know, related to the fact that you could have 62,000 um, arrests, you know, but there's very few actual convictions. Um, I had the opportunity to attend a training last year where they had a federal prosecutor talk about how hard it is for them to prosecute somebody. Um, and this, this wasn't just your average Joe down the street. These were like big time traffickers and how difficult it is to get that information and part of it is because they know they can get away with it and they know that oftentimes their victims are scared and so they won't talk and it's like and it's trying to convince them in order to be able to to do that and the prosecutor is saying one of the toughest things is trying to get someone out of the life is getting them to trust them as their prosecutor that it's going to be okay and they're going to be they're going to be safe you know we also have to talk about how women in the sex industry oftentimes are dehumanized. You know, if you look at, again, a lot of sex sites and pornography and things like that, there's the level of violence that is portrayed in these is pretty, pretty high. And so, you know, again, it's like anything else where it's like, you know, these are the images, this is kind of what we're dealing. Um, and so we've had people that have have done this to the point that, you know, we see here Gregory Ridgway, who was the Green, um, the Green River Killer, and this is a quote that he had, and the fact that he tended to pick a lot of what he deemed as prostitutes, um, and he didn't want to pay for sex, and so it's like you have this caught, they figured that he could kill as many as he wanted to, because no one was going to be, look for a, a street worker um, without getting caught, and so this gives you a little bit more information about him in particular, and so if you're not familiar with him, you know, certainly you can you can look up the things that he that he did. But the fact that, you know, he had 20, 48 victims and 27 of them were youth between the ages of 15 and 18 years old. And they were people that he deemed as not worthy of existing on this planet because he was because they were considered to be sex workers. And so it's that dehumanization that kind of happens. And when you look, you know, and you look at things like unsolved murders, unfortunately, it's not unusual for someone who has gotten involved in the life to be murdered and no one ends up looking for them. So they end up not only being unsolved murders, but those are bodies that they find where they have no idea even how to locate next of kin because folks have kind of 
written them off and they're not being looked. So it, it really ends up being unfortunate and sad. And, you know, frankly, it can be from, from our perspective as workers, it can be incredibly, incredibly um, depressing to deal with. And this last slide is just something for you all to, to look at. And this, again, kind of shows you how all of these things are intersecting um, to create this dynamic that is CSEC itself. And none of this uh, would happen if there wasn't a demand economy, right? So for those of you who took an econ class in, in, um, in college or are currently taking one, right, like there is that demand and supply, and, and, and we see that demand, demand is high, right? So like estimates are that one out of seven men participate in this, about 700,000 men in, in, in uh, Pennsylvania purchase sex or continue to purchase sex, right? So it's just something to, um, to think about. Um, I, I read a report about a couple years ago to calculate the, the estimate of, of annual sex buyers in, in our area, and it's like, uh, one way that we can do it is by um, the adult population in your area times 0.14 is probably the best um, the best estimate, right? So just think about like if we have um, a million people uh, in and that's you know that's a large population when you multiply that by 0.14. <clears throat> Again, the the um, Another estimate, 60% uh, of, of men in the U.S. have paid for sex, right? So I think this is from demandabolition.org. Uh, uh, half of them have never talked about that um, to, uh, to other people. Um, and then ha uh, almost half of, of, of people involved in commercial sex, um, sex work um, have been harmed um, or, or been forced um, um, uh, to do things um, by men. So. Um, so just something else from someone who was involved in, in, in the work, um, a, a quote from them. So just to show that there is a demand um, uh, and we live in a, in, in a demand economy. Some ways that our youth are, 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 are recruited, right, like through online job listings, I think this is something that we, we see um, uh, constantly um, that are being posted. Um, uh, one of our young people just showed me um, a Twitter post uh, uh, not too long ago, you know, to looking for online models, and all you had to do was send them a naked screenshot of yourself, right? So, um, and, and, and this is happening. This is, like, on, on Twitter, on, on Instagram, um, the, the uh, media that our young people are using. Commission-based sales scams, uh, we talked about this, those pyramid schemes, they're ripe for exploitation of our young people. Um, and then obviously the social media posts that are there um, that we're uh, not seeing. Um, and then the recruitment, where is it happening, right? Um, it's happening everywhere, right? And it's interesting that like one of the things that is not posted here, there's the government assisting off assistance offices, um, but, um, but it's also happening where our locations are at, right? I think this is something that I have personal experience with at our maternity group home where, um, we had people that would drive up and like entice our young people with like, here, do you need a new phone? Do you need a couple bucks? Uh, do you need new shoes? And they would they would literally park themselves in our parking lot. Um, there's a story here where like I uh, chased one of the cars down trying to get their license plate. I would not encourage that. That was bad judgment on my part. Um, but it's something that like was happening. Um, um, in, uh, here at Valley Youth House, and like you know, we did uh, we did put um, prevention. You know, we uh, to stop that. We now have 24-hour uh, staff, right? Like that are up and and checking. Um, but uh, recruiters know where where they can find um, young people, um, and especially young people who are are ripe for exportation. Right. Yeah, so just some ads, right? Like these are old ads. Um, I think I should update this with, uh, with like the new Twitter feeds and what's, what's, in, what's on Instagram. But uh, these are uh, things that, that uh, our young people are constantly being bombarded with. Yeah, and they all, again, they appear very, very um, innocent, whether it's on there or, you know, one of the social media sites that is huge for trafficking um, is Instagram. And that's something that probably a lot of you even have is an, is an Instagram account. You know, certainly I have an Instagram account. My niece and nephew who are young teenagers have Instagram accounts because it's considered to be relatively innocent. 
but it's also a platform that people have, have used because you know many of you might know that there used to be a site called Backpage and it ended up being shut down but the thing about it was that it disappeared and 10 versions of it popped back up literally as alternatives to Backpage and they were like fine then we'll just take it to Twitter we'll just take it to Instagram we'll just take it to other sites and it flies under the radar because it does appear so so normal. It's like, yeah, traveling sales crew or something along the lines of like, do you enjoy music? And, you know, our kids are like, yeah, of course I love music. And next thing you know, they've kind of been. Yeah. And, and these ads, like um, from my conversations with our young people who are living in our shelter, it's like they see these ads and they see this as an alternative. Like I can like work in the sales crews and they're going to provide me with a home and they're going to provide me with like a plate of uh, work and I'm going to have money. Right. And they, and they don't realize that like, um, that these could be uh, nefarious, like, reasons why this person is doing this, right? And I think this is where having those conversations as a case manager and, like, right, like, if we remember from um, from um, uh, earlier about uh, brain development is that our young people don't have that brain development, so we constantly have to have these conversations about is, how is, um, who is this person you're working with? How safe is it? Where are you going to be living? How much money are you having? Is it a contract? Like, is there something written or is it just verbal, right? Like, I think these are things that, like, sometimes we have to, like, probe and ask questions with our young people before they just, like, discharge and, like, leave. I'm like, I'm going to go work here and I'm just going to make $50,000 a year. I'm like, mm, um, social workers don't make that much. How are you going to make that? Anyway, so. Right, and, you know, and I think we, we know that it, those ads do work because many of us, while we may have never – become a victim of exploitation, you know, that's how any multi-level sales scheme works. They get you interested and they might say management development program. You know, I think about, you know, much earlier before I got into working with kids and, you know, I applied to be in a management development program and it was to sell Kirby vacuum cleaners. You know, and as someone who was college educated, I very quickly knew that that's what was going on, but it's like being able to help our youth kind of navigate that as, as well. So looking specifically at um, some children that are at risk, so now we're talking about um, minors in, in this particular case, just to give you a little bit of a framework from, from there. Um, who does this list look like? Really, what it looks like is all kids. If you think about every teenager you've ever worked with, how many of them you know, are latchkey kids, have access to a computer? They all do. I mean, their phone is a computer. And the majority of them have a smartphone, so they have that access. You know, most teenagers and young adults feel misunderstood. Nobody gets me, man. They're maybe fighting with their with their, their parents. And so, you know, it's not always the presumption even that it's a homeless youth that's doing with this. We, you know, we have youth that are trafficked, and they go to school on a regular basis. But, you know, we have to be aware of all of a sudden someone who that's going on. Or if you mentioned much earlier, um, we talked about family, and sometimes family will traffic their their children. The idea is that you know their parents see a way to be able to make ends meet. This happens whether they're gang involved or not. But it's like you know, hey, you want to make some money? Well, then let me sleep with your son. Let me sleep with your daughter. Here's some money, and also now that's how um, the bills are being the bills are being paid. Which then also goes back to that myth of everyone being a willing participant. Well, it wasn't, you know. My mom set me up for this. My dad set me up for this, you know, with his with his his buddies and his friends. And then, you know, and really it's like they started paying him for that, and then it kind of became okay. So we want to keep in mind that basically all children are at risk. But we also want to recognize that there are certain youth that are going to be at much higher risk. And so some of those risk factors you can see here, um, any sort of events that are going on are characteristics of an individual's life. We want to look at those. We want to look at you know, what kind of neighborhood or community do they come from? Do they come from a tight-knit community, or does one that is very um, disconnected? Is it an environment maybe where there is a lot of violence or a lot of gun activity? Is there a lot of abject poverty? You know, and so that's regardless of where you are because, you know, we know that we have a lot of rural areas where there's a lot of abject poverty, and so those youth are equally as at risk as our um, urban inner city youth. So we can't automatically be like, oh, this is an inner city um, issue. So, you know, whether you're in the western part of the state or e even here, you know, we have some very rural areas where you have that, that poverty level that you want to be careful 
of as well. And, you know, they're seeing it as an opportunity to get, to get out of that. You know, also it's like, you know, what kind of cultures are going on that make it possible? You know, and kind of thinking about then, and this is a good one to take back to your programs again as a supervisor, is really kind of think about, you know, what is the culture of the environments that our youth are growing up in? You know, what is the culture of our community? What is the culture of the schools that they attend? What is the culture of, you know, kind of everything around them? What is the culture that they surround themselves in? And recognizing that some of those by nature are going to create some risk factors for our youth. So looking at some statistics that have been found to be a little bit more uh, reliable, but again, staying open to the fact that we may find, you know, two, three, five years from now, this might not be accurate. Um, we have found, though, that most of them have been, have had a prior history of some form of child sexual abuse. So when you're doing, as a case manager, um, when you're doing that intake and you get that information and you find out that one of the youth or young adults that you're serving maybe was sexually abused as a child, you're going, that's going to be a red flag. And while you might not automatically assume, oh, then they must be getting traffic because, you know, that correlation does not make causation, you're going to want to keep that in the back of your head. So when you start looking at, you know, I'm going to evaluate some of the things that a young adult is telling me, some of the things that they're doing, you're going to want to start checking things off your list and be like, okay, so they're getting money and it doesn't make any sense. They can't provide any sort of pay stubs. They can't do this. All right, check. Um, are they coming in with maybe some sort of marks or bruises that don't make any sense? Check. Do they have a history of sexual abuse? Check. So again, those are evaluation tools that you're going to be uh, looking at because there is that high rate of incidence. And Loyola University in New Orleans did a study of 641 runaway and homeless youth across the country. And in their study, they uh, saw that about 20% were uh, had some form of trafficking experience, and 14% were sex traffic, 8% had labor trafficking, and 3% had both, right? This, and this is a similar trend that the Urban Institute did, I think, in, I think in 2017 or 2018. Uh, they did something similar and found similar trends. We uh, at Val Youth House did a snapshot about a year ago um, where we, we were seeing 10% um, of our young people were, um, uh, were involved in some form of trafficking. We did a snapshot at a drop-in center. We asked uh, some trafficking questions. And we know that like that's an under report. Uh, about 56 kids took the took our survey at Value House at our drop-in center, and we, and our estimates were, or at least like from our initial was 10%. Uh, but we know that's an under under representation because like how truthful were they going to come in? I was like, oh, I'm going to come to this safe place where I can hang out, and they're asking me these difficult questions, and I'm just not going to answer them, right? So I think this is, uh, we know that like um, it, it was under representation. So this just really highlights the fact that with our runaway and homeless youth community, it is happening. And, it, uh, and uh, like Liz said, that like uh, um, there are higher risks for our uh, runaway and homeless youth, right? For many factors that are, are coming into play um, uh, that make them a, a, a higher risk population. So, there's also an intersection between child welfare and CSAC, right? So for many of the same reasons, right? So in Florida, um, uh, from their data, you know, saw that there were almost a thousand allegations of human trafficking in, in Florida's child welfare system made in 2014, right? That's just a, a huge number for, uh, um, um, uh, for us. So it just highlights the fact that, like, you know, our young people who are in the child welfare system and have many of those same risk factors, right? So they um, don't have um, that permanency, that family that they can um, uh, rely on. So they're, they're then relying on alternatives, gangs and um, um, pimps, et, et cetera. Um, and even as they age out, right, like as our young people are aging out, what are they aging out to if they don't have those skills to be, uh, to be independent, right? So I think that just highlights, um, highlights that. Um, and also notice that it says 2014, so it jumped almost doubled in from 2011. From 2011, so imagine what that statistic probably was from 2018 if yeah. they looked at that same and number. And again, some of that is uh, due to more accurate reporting, but then more accurate reporting also means that we have the potential to 
help more more youth. Yeah, and then I was um, I sat in on a uh, work group at the state level that looked at all the um, calls, the child line calls in in Pennsylvania, um, and it was also staggering that almost every county in Pennsylvania um, had at least one call or uh, of of a suspected trafficking allegation. So um, I couldn't share that with you guys uh, because I, I didn't have permission to share that that uh, graphic. But it was just something to to um, to really highlight that's even happening here uh, in in Pennsylvania, just like it's happening in Connecticut, where 130 victims of sex trafficking were identified in in 2014, um, and 98% of these victims. Uh, were involved with uh, child welfare system in some manner, right? So, and we say some manner because some of them might have been in care, or the, or there was some kind of um, reporting um, or uh, caseworker involved um, with them. Again, just again highlighting that there's a huge um, intersection between child welfare uh, and CSEC. So, <clears throat> what do we do with this information, right? And I think this is where um, I get this a lot um, from especially from our, uh, our programs here at Valley Youth House, right? So our programs uh, that are working directly with runaway and homeless youth are at the forefront of this battle, right? So um, we provide a crucial role in helping our, uh, the survivors of, of exploitation, right? So, um, for example, our street outreach program is at the forefront providing young people with, with the immediate concerns. We talk about evidence interventions of how to help um, how to help, and I think we are those, right? Like I think our programs, who are are at the forefront, um, are those interventions of of helping um, uh, Pennsylvania's um, most vulnerable population, which is a runaway and homeless youth, right? So I think like by providing them with with the, their immediate needs, with housing, with the resources needed to find employment. Um, it, it, um, some of those consciousness raising groups that we provide in, in our agencies, like how do we then like are able to um, do that more effectively? I think this is where like when we identify the survivors, like we are we are the intervention, at least the first round um, of, of intervention of providing their immediate needs. Um, and then just identifying, I think people are like, then how do we know? I think it is that relationship building, right? Like I think like as you create, as we create, safe places for our young people to be at as we um, are more aware and changing our language. Um, my experience has always been that youth are going to uh, open up and are going to tell their story. And once they tell their story, then it's our job to then provide them with, um, with the services that they need. Yes. I think another piece to this as well is, you know, again, these are, these are people who are hiding in plain sight. So they're there, but we don't recognize mm -hmm. Um, that they that they are there, um, or certainly those who have been child welfare workers, um, social workers, anyone who's worked in human services, we may pick up on it. But the nice thing is that the next phase of this is we're getting this information to more people. So there was a rather large trafficking conference, uh, CSEC conference, that happened at one of our local universities last summer, and there were, as a matter of fact, Andrew was one of the presenters at at said conference. But um, one of the nice things about it is that we had a lot more people attending who were in education, in law enforcement, and um, medical staff. Because one of the things that happens, especially with things like medical staff, is that a youth or even one of our young adults who has maybe been exploited, the first time that they're going to be, that something's going to show up is a medical problem. Whether it's going to be um, instances of STIs, um, any sort of trauma they've had, maybe from violent sex acts, or any sort of medical issue. And the issue was that you, they were presenting to ER doctors, because that's usually what will happen, you know, because let's face it, someone who's, who, who's um, being exploited probably does not have a primary care physician, so they're going to present to the ER. ER doctors and ER nurses didn't know what to look for. So they would see a young person who was presenting with these particular issues, and oftentimes some of the same language and stigmas that we're seeing and that we were talking about earlier in the training were what their mindsets were. So instead of being treated from a calm, caring, compassionate standpoint of someone who's maybe being injured, it was often viewed as, well, if you would just stop doing this, you wouldn't have this problem. If you would stop being loose, 
you wouldn't have this problem. Um, and so they were missing some of those, those signs. Same thing with, with law enforcement, you know, kind of like seeing somebody and rounding them up and kind of going, wait a minute, something doesn't seem right here. And instead of viewing them as a criminal, be like, what can we do to potentially get them, them help? It always is heartwarming for us when we have those relationships with law enforcement that instead of them looking to maybe prosecute somebody or arrest somebody, they call something like our street outreach workers and say, hey, I've got this kid. Something doesn't seem right. Do you mind coming out and seeing them? and they give us the opportunity to do an assessment as opposed to treating them as, as a criminal. Same thing with teachers. As I mentioned, some of these youth are still going to school and they're going to school regularly, you know, asking questions and seeing what's kind of going on. Do things just not make sense? Do they seem more tired or worn out than normal? Was it somebody who was regularly attending and all of a sudden their attendance has become much more sporadic and their stories don't make sense? or they start talking about all these places that they travel to over the weekends. It's like, oh yeah, no, I was in DC this weekend, and then I was in Baltimore, and I was up in Boston for a couple days. And you're kind of going, how do they even afford to be able to, to do that? You know, and so getting those, those red flags, because maybe you're you know, oversharing them talking in the hallway, or they're showing their peers about things that they have. So it's really also educating the collective to understand and view use differently so they can ask those those questions and not not ignoring um, what is going on because oftentimes it's right in front of them. Um, and if a use kind of like blatantly in front of them, they might be like, no, you don't know what you're talking about, I'm fine. But they appreciate the fact that you're asking and when we start getting into what can be done, which is the next and the end part of our presentation, they're more open to the possibility because you've kind of seemed cool to begin with and you're calm and you're understanding and, and things of that nature. So, you know, a lot of the work is not only the work that we need to do internally, but then how can we transfer that information to other groups that we are participating with, who are our partners in, in all this, and even expanding how we view our partners to make sure they're getting the information that they need as well. So. Now that we've gotten through all this incredibly sobering information and probably depressed a lot of you thoroughly uh, with a lot of the statistics and the information, we want to go like, what can be done? Because of course, you know, with all this, it's like, okay, that's great, but what can we do about it? And so there's a number of different levels, and part of what we're going to look at are some legislative pieces of it. You know, to let everybody know that this isn't being ignored from the state level or from the federal level. So a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about in the beginning is more um, the federal level, and then we'll get into what some of the states have done, including Pennsylvania. Um, so we now know what is being defined as trafficking and that it, it can in, in, involve people. So from what we do is we get into things like safe harbor laws. And safe harbor laws have probably been one of the biggest advantages that we've had. And really what safe harbor does is it's decriminalizing these youth that have been exploited. So instead of viewing them as needing um, to be dealt with in the, whether juvenile justice or the criminal law system, it is giving them some legal protections and is also providing services that they may need in order to be their best selves and to get the help um, that they need. Some of those examples that have happened is um, like in New York State, one of the things that they did was that if someone had been convicted of a crime um, and it's then been found later that they were in fact a victim of exploitation, those convictions are being vacated. So they're disappearing off their records, which is huge because if you've got somebody who has gotten out of the life and they're doing the things that they, that they need to, and maybe they're working, maybe they're um, back in education, they're finishing um, their high school education, maybe they're in college, and they wanna move on. Maybe they wanna work with other victims and help them become survivors. Their convictions were getting in the way because depending on what they were, they were felonies. And while some states and some cities have done a great job with what we refer to as ban the box, where that doesn't necessarily preclude you from being able to um, proceed with something, it was still creating a roadblock, which meant that you were still trapping somebody for things that they had done that they were forced to do over, over time. And so it's vacating those and giving folks the opportunity to basically get a real fresh, fresh start. 
in Pennsylvania, um, as of October of last year, um, we did end up now finally having a Pennsylvania Safe Harbor law. So if you looked at the previous slide, in New York they had Safe Harbor starting in 2010. Um, but it's taken a little while for Pennsylvania to get there. The great thing is that this was a universally supported bill in the state, so it had support from both sides of legislation. So from both Democrats and Republicans, there really wasn't any fight. I think it almost went through pretty closely unanimously when it was passed, and then it was signed by the governor without any um, question. And so it was originally sponsored by Senator uh, Stuart Greenleaf, and it creates new safeguards for children of human trafficking. And if you look, some of the things that it is um, that it does is it creates immunity for, for victims, um, and it also directs the Department of Human Services to coordinate specialized services. Now, all those services are not in place yet, and that is kind of the work that needs to be, to be done, because oftentimes we kind of pass legislation and we kind of go, great, so now what do we do with it? And so that's kind of where we're at, we're at now, because they had 90 days to get everything enacted from the time that it was signed in October, which means then things needed to be enacted as of January of this year. So this is super, super new. So we're only 90 days in at, point, at this point of it actually having to been enacted. And so we're slowly starting to see where that is going to go. And so that may also impact a lot of you as service providers because you may be asked to be one of the providers of some of these services that are going to be um, necessary. It's also requiring that training that we just mentioned to make sure that law enforcement understands what's going on and that everybody can kind of work together collaboratively. So this is a great thing that has finally happened that is across the board in the state of Pennsylvania. It's just a matter of us getting it enacted and that is gonna take time, but you should be aware that it's there because it was so new and it wasn't something that was like blasted out in the media. Um, if you do a quick search, you will find the actual article, but you know that information is there and so now you have the opportunity to be at the forefront of that and kind of look at what is your organization, what does your agency want to do to be kind of a part of that solution that is going on. And then how to respond, I think I mentioned this in a, in a previous slide already, but it's like having that survivor-centered approach, right, like being able to reassure that we're here to help, to build trust and rapport, and, and, and really building that relationship uh, with the young, uh, with our young person, uh, be conscious uh, that they're, you know, like what we've stated, that they're not criminals, but they're actually here, they're survivors. Uh, patients, right, I, um, relationship patients, that like it does take time to build that relationship. And I think for many of us that are doing direct service work, right, like we have deadlines, we have things, we have documentations to get, and even our rapid rehousing programs, right, they're time limited, right? So I think these are things where we like um, having that patience um, um, and then actually, and then the collaborative, right? Like the collaboration amongst all all service providers in in, um, in the area. Like uh, Liz said, that it's not just the human service providers like ourselves, but it's also the um, the emergency room, the the schools. Like, how can we then network and be able to then like um, uh, be able to have that collaboration that works across systems? But our interactions, right? Like, right. It, uh, need to be casual, uh, you know, we isolate the, the young person when, when possible, which, which just means that, like, you know, there might be someone watching them, so, like, as we can get them away so they can tell their story freely um, without um, uh, the fear that someone's watching or, or going to cause harm to them. Being careful with our questions, especially regarding those indicators, I think being non-judgmental, right, like, when we're asking them and just, you know, those open-ended questions that, like, um, um, that many of us have been trained to do, like, you know, can you, um, can you tell me your story? What's going on, right? Like these, so having them tell, uh, rather than saying like, um, are, are you being sex trafficked, right? Like, uh, that's not a good question to ask, right? Like, it's really about like, how are we having them tell our story? Uh, or having, how are we having them tell their story, right? Um, also, don't call or text without permission, right? I think this is where that, that consent from, from them is, is crucial. Um, uh, and then um, and then our messaging, you know, like we're here to help. We're here to be, uh, your safety is our priority. Um, you have the right to live without being abused or exploited and, and that they have rights and that we're going to fight for their rights. 
and that we're going to help them find those um, those services if, um, if if we can't provide it for them, right? And 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 the help is is available. Yeah, I think a lot of it also, you know, Andrew mentioned about relationship, and with that relationship, a lot of it is very it's light touch interactions. So it's the idea that you're just kind of letting them know that you're okay, that you're safe, that there's an there's an area, and you know, being very casual about it, like not making a big deal. Oftentimes, if you're giving them information, giving them something very very small, um, and there not being a lot of information even on that. So you know, one of the good ways to kind of pass numbers on is to give people business cards but kind of masking those cards in a way that it's not super obvious so that if the person that is with them is like, what did they give you? If they hand them the card, it seems very innocuous um, and it isn't, it isn't um, obvious. Some of you may be familiar with websites where if you want to get help from trafficking, or not trafficking, but even um, abuse, if you want to get out of an abusive relationship, they have if somebody walks in the room, you can click a button and it will very quickly go to like Yahoo or something. So you want to make sure that it's not obvious and potentially puts them in more in more danger. Yeah, and, and just from um, my experience at working at our drop-in center, we do get survivors of trafficking or current um, people that are being trafficked uh, currently um, into our drop-in center. And I think some of the things that we do is like creating that safe place. Um, um, uh, we do follow a harm reduction model. So not, I know not all agencies can follow that model but like we follow a harm reduction model. So like we um, tell our young people that we're here for them. Uh, we give them out condoms and tell them that like, um, um, if, um, and again, this is for anyone over 18. It's different if they're under 18, but like we give them um, condoms. We tell them that we're here to, uh, if they need to get tested, right, um, that we can then link them to medical services when needed. Um, and it's it's interesting when we take that approach where like that safe and having those um, 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 uh, different types of questioning and that different mindset that we're not being judgmental, we're not uh, accusing them of anything. Like they they really do open up and they really want to tell their story and and most of them don't want to be in it, right? Like and I think this is where then like our case manager is helping them find like, you know, are there openings in, the, in, in rapid rehousing? Are there openings in other locations? So we're working with them through that process, um, and then hopefully uh, at, some, uh, at some point, like, we can then link them up to the services and then um, not be involved in, in, that, in that lifestyle anymore. Right. You know, if they're telling you that they are in the, um, that they are a sex worker, maybe, you know, it is survival sex. And, you know, the reality is we're not going to immediately be able to say, oh, well, you should stop doing that, and I don't know how you're going to pay your rent and have food to eat, but you should just stop. So it's like that's not going to work. So it's like, you know, helping them with other things, finding out, like, what are they interested in? What are their hopes? What are their dreams? Are there other things that we could work them toward? Because oftentimes it really is that harm reduction. It might be a step-down process that instead of them doing that 60 hours a week, now they're down to 40 hours a week. Yeah. And, and our approach, our harm reduction approach, it only works if that if the collaboration is there. And I think that's something that like we're then able to refer that like um, to other services because we find out like oh you have this need, then like you you have a, a legal issue, then we can like there's a lawyer that we can definitely link you up with, right? Like or like um, um, that uh, that they have a chronic illness that we can then like oh we have a very um, uh, we have a, a nurse practitioner that works well with us, and sh if you go to her, make a referral to her, she'll definitely help you and be non-judgmental. And no knowing what's out there, and like being able to work as a community versus like in our silos. Right. And even you know something as simple as how you dress when you're working with a lot of these folks and approaching them can make a huge, huge difference. If you're out in the community, there's a reason why a lot of our street outreach workers, we, I joke about our street outreach workers who I absolutely adore that. If you see people who look homeless with a Valley Youth House ID, there are street outreach um, folks. But it, it works. They certainly don't look like a typical like social worker. They're not walking up in a tie or a really frilly outfit or, or something like that. It's, you know, it's kind of like they look like just about – anybody this is the information's there so it's also not going to raise as much suspicion right away you know it doesn't mean that you necessarily should look like you did just roll up off the street but it's like you know thinking about especially if you're going and doing any sort of community work really keeping it in that 
that in mind that you're also presenting yourself in a way that appears approachable and not standoffish, that you don't appear like an administrator, even if you happen to be, well, an administrator. That's okay. You know, but if you're doing that work, you know, taking that time to be to be a little bit more, more casual. So I shouldn't go to our drop-in center with the suit and tie? You might want to at least take the tie off. Um, maybe roll up the sleeves and go look like Don Johnson or something from Miami Vice, go that style. So here's just some resources that we wanted to throw on. These are some national resources. We didn't add any for the state because we honestly, there are so many different organizations that are doing really good work. You know, in our area, we mentioned VAST, which is Valley Against Sex Trafficking. Um, our Bucks County Street Outreach does a lot of work with BCAT. Uh, in certain areas, the Y, I believe, in the central region, in our central region, um, the Y is doing a lot of really great work. So it's really kind of figuring out, like, who is doing this work and then, you know, spending some time to maybe partner up with, with them in order. But this is a good starting point are some of these, um, some of these resources that we've provided you, you here. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, there are no questions. All right. So then if you need or have any questions and you didn't feel like sharing them now or maybe you have some questions later you're wondering about, uh, here are mine and Andrew's contact information. Uh, we promise to get back to you. Um, even if it's not right away, we will promise to take some time and get back to you because you know, we do enjoy sharing this information with, with everybody, and so we want to make sure that, you know, our youth and young adults throughout the state are getting the best services that they, that they possibly can. So I'm just going to jump in and uh, do a quick wrap-up. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, so as we had the technical difficulties, Elizabeth and Andrew had a slide that Brendan did not have. And so we'll actually uh, find a way to uh, provide that information to you in our follow-up email. Um, and just a, a couple of reminders, um, if you have further questions, as uh, Elizabeth and Andrew said, you can follow up with them. You can send an email to the uh, Western or Eastern COC's email addresses. Um, um, perhaps Brendan can post those in the chat. Um, again, the, the webinar has been recorded, so if you have colleagues that you feel would benefit from watching, please be sure to let them know. Uh, Brendan's going to be posting a link to access the recording to the workplace and the COC's website, and we'll send out the link as well via email. Um, and a final reminder about the, the survey links that you're going to receive, just to let folks know, you're going to receive two because one of the surveys will be to let you a, a form that you can tell us that you participated in today's training. Again, if you're a COC-funded agency, you want to be sure to fill that out uh, so that we have a record that you did participate. Uh, the other survey is going to be our typical post-event feedback survey, and we always uh, really appreciate to get uh, folks' feedback um, and information about what this uh, webinar, what was good about it, what you want to see in the future. Um, that's very helpful. I want to extend a special thanks uh, to uh, Elizabeth and Andrew for guiding us through the important topics uh, throughout this webinar series and also for today because this is a very difficult topic. And a special thanks to Brendan. Uh, he's really been navigating the changeover to Skype for Business from WebEx. Um, and there have been some challenges along the way, but he's uh, really been very helpful for all of us. So thanks, Brendan, uh, for doing that and for handling the tech today. Um, so again, thanks everybody for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you all. Thanks Elizabeth and Andrew for, for all, all your help and wealth of knowledge that you shared with us all. Much appreciated. Thank you, Brendan, for all of your, your assistance in all this as well. My pleasure. Take care, everyone. Thanks.